just so we don't have any feedback or anything. Okay, sounds good. Uh, getting started now. Uh, so this next part of the tutorial, we're going to walk through an example service. The example service is called um, conveniently example service. And uh, you can find it inside of the uh, inside of the uh, the GitHub repository. So all of the code is there. We will have the code uh, snippets of it in the slide deck because that's the uh, more convenient way to uh, present it. So the order we're going to go through that is we'll first uh, define the models for the service. Uh, then we will uh, define the synchronizer. And then we'll look at how this uh, service plugs into some of the other aspects of XOS, such as the REST API, the Django admin, uh, the Tosca engine, and uh, how you would create a uh, custom view for it. Um, so starting with the models, um, I, I think this is certainly the most uh, critical critical part when defining a service since just about everything touches the models and the models directly impact the uh, database schema that you'll end up with. Most of our services we partition into two models. Uh, one of them would be the service model which holds sort of the service the service wide parameters for the service and then the other would be a tenant model which holds just the parameters of a service that are applicable to a specific tenant in a multi-tenant service. So we're going to start by defining the service model for example service. And the first thing we do is we associate a kind with the uh, with a service. And the kind is just an ASCII string, but it does have to be unique for each service. So we just rely on uh, people to come up with their own string that differentiates their service from the other ones. In this case, we've chosen the string example service. Then you'll see some of this meta stuff here. Uh, what this does is, is uh, primarily Django stuff. And what the, the first thing does is associates the service with a Django app that allows you to sort of aggregate your services together in an app abstraction, which we imagine most people will want one service per app. So we've just simply set the app name to the service name. And then verbose name is, is that's primarily a display thing and impacts the Django admin UI. So finally down at the bottom of the slice we'll get to something that's uh, that's that's interesting here and that's where we define a custom field on our service. And the custom field we've decided to call it service message. It's a character field, and we set a maximum length and a help text for that. Uh, Django supports a, a fairly rich set of different types of fields you can declare, uh, including most of your common uh, database schema things, you know, like uh, character fields, integer fields, booleans, uh, date times, etc. So you can you can look through the Django documentation and, and add whatever custom fields you might be applicable to your service. If you had uh, more attributes that you'd want to associate with your service, then it's perfectly acceptable to have lots and lots of fields if you needed them. The next model that we're going to define for the uh, example service is its tenant. And we're going to subclass this off of uh, sort of a helper class called tenant with container. And what we've done with uh, tenant with container, I think Larry alluded to this earlier, is we've aggregated some common functionality there that lots of people seem to need to use, and that is the functionality that that has a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, tenants and containers to hold the uh, compute resources that implement the tenant. And we use this, for example, in the VSG where you'll have um, a VSG tenant and it will have a compute container that implements the VSG for that tenant. And we do that with example tenant. Uh, what, what example tenant is going to do is it's going to implement an instance for each uh, tenant and that instance is going to run a web server. And at the very end of this demo we'll get to see that in practice where you'll be able to see the page 
uh, served up by the web server from these tenant objects. So the, the tenant object, it's, it's sort of similar to the service object. It also has a kind. Uh, by convention, the kind is the same for a tenant object as is for the service object. It kind of helps everyone know that they go together. It also has this Django meta section, which sets the uh, verbose name for display purposes in the UI. And we've defined a field here. This is uh, tenant underscore message. And it's a character field. And it's sort of a counterpart to this, the service message that we defined in the service model. This is going to let us uh, set a message for each tenant. And then when we actually spawn the web server, for example, service, we will compose the service message with the tenant message and serve that page to the client. Now we have some functions. So Django sort of uh, it locates the code and the schema sort of together like this. So you've defined your data model with the, uh, the fields that you've added to it. And then you also supply some code that says how to implement your object. Uh, in this case, we've implemented three functions, which are the initializer for the object, the save method, and the delete method. The initializer has some stuff here that will automatically um, set the provider service for the, uh, the tenant object to an example service. Uh, since example tenants go with example services, that's pretty much a safe bet and it avoids the user having to look up that provider service when he creates his object. We can, we can just set a default. For the save and the delete methods, this is where we've integrated some of the model policy code and we've uh, integrated it directly into the models.py file. So when we save the object, we're going to run a model policy that is provided, uh, well, we'll see that on the next slide. We'll run this model policy, and it'll be responsible for bringing up the instance. And then when we delete the object, we want to run another model policy that will clean up um, any XOS resources that are associated with this tenant. Okay, let me go to the next slide. So here's the next slide, and it shows the little bit of model policy code that we've associated with um, example tenant. It's leveraging highly on the uh, tenant with container object, which provides this manage container function, which will automatically set up a container or instance uh, to go along with your, uh, with your tenant. So this is, this is mostly boilerplate here, but if you had other custom uh, work you wanted to do or other objects that needed to be created, this is where you would put them. And in uh, some of the more complex services like BSG, for example, the model policy has a number of additional steps such as connecting the BSG to the V router, things like that. And I'm going to be looking at some of those services later, so we'll just continue with uh, the specifics on example service for now. So the next step after you've defined your model policies is to set up your sync steps. And the sync steps are what take the state from the XOS data model and apply that state to the underlying service. So in our example with example service, uh, those steps are going to be to spawn a web server inside of the inside of the instances associated with the tenant, and then to uh, set up a page in that web server. So you, for any time you want to do one of these sync steps, you'll often write some Python code, and then you'll write an Ansible recipe. So this here is the Python code. And there is a, you set up a class for each uh, object you want to sync. So this class is called sync example tenant. It's going to leverage on another helper class called sync instance using Ansible. That kind of goes along with that uh, tenant with container uh, class that we use when setting up the model. These classes together, they, they know how to uh, bring up an instance for you. Um, there's a few values you'll have to set in your class that provides and observes values. They will tell which uh, which object is associated with this sync step. So the reason that there's two of these is they do slightly different things within 
synchronizer framework, I believe observes tells what uh, what objects will kind of wake up this sync step and cause it to run. So if you tell it to observe example tenant, then it'll be watching for changes to example tenant objects. Provides lists the uh, set of objects that you'll be syncing. And so by setting provides to example tenant, we say that when we observe a change in example tenant, we will provide the synchronization of an example tenant. In almost all cases, uh, provides and observes are going to be set to the same object. Uh, I'm not even sure if we have an example any more of them being set to different objects. So just assume, assume you'll set both of those to the same thing for now. Uh, requested interval. Um, this, for most people, you'd normally set this to zero. This is your opportunity to delay your sync step. So, for example, we had some sync steps that would take a long time to run. So we scheduled them to run once per day. And in that case, you would set requested interval to, uh, I think we set it to 86,400 seconds, which is the uh, number of seconds in the day. But most people will simply set it to zero. Template name is the name of the Ansible template. It's actually a Jinja 2 template that will create an Ansible template, but it is the, the template that we're going to supply. We're going to work on it. We're going to supply it to Ansible to actually carry out the synchronization. And since this, uh, since this sync step is SSHing into an instance in order to bring up this web server, it has to have a private key for that. So we have configured a private public key pair, and this specifies the private half of that key pair, where to find it um, in the XOS uh, installation in, in your deployment. So now the next part is we have to we have to specify how we take fields from the data model objects and convert those into variables that we will pass to Ansible. And various synchronizers do these uh, this step in slightly different ways. This sync instance using Ansible uh, allows you to find a function called get extra attributes. And then you take uh, on the right hand of these statements you can see the data model object. So o.tenant message is a data model object and we're assigning it into this uh, fields dictionary in the tenant message field. Then we're going to go do the same thing with the uh, service message sticking it in a dictionary. So that has populated the variables and the sync instance using Ansible sync step that it is automatically set up to run a playbook for you with the assumption that the playbook will handle configuring your service. So the next the next step to do is to create this playbook. So the, the top half of this is mostly boilerplate that comes from the uh, sync instance using Ansible mechanism that we use to configure the instance. And there's, uh, there's a host entry which ties this host into a host file that's automatically generated for you. And it tells it to connect via SSH, use the Ubuntu user, to uh, sudo so that it can uh, perform tasks as uh, root. And then this gather facts, turning that off is, uh, is a performance optimization, I believe is why we have that in there, to speed up the execution of the playbook. So you'll recall we had that dictionary we set up in the Python, which set a field called tenant message and the field called service message. Um, I'm here to get a feedback from somewhere. Anyway, these, uh, this variable section takes the tenant message and the service message from the dictionary that we supplied and assigns those into uh, Ansible playback fields, or playbook fields, I'm sorry. And those, uh, those variables in the uh, playbook can then be used inside of these roles when we generate templates um, and, and run steps on the, in the Ansible playbook. So the role specifies a list of roles that we want to achieve with this playbook. So we know we want to do two things. One of those is installing the Apache uh, web server. And the other is creating an index.html file. I'm only going to show one of these for the purposes of these demo. 
and that will be uh, the create index uh, role. And I should say the primary reason I believe for using this uh, level of indirection with a role is so that we can uh, reuse these roles amongst multiple playbooks. So for example, if you have multiple playbooks that wanted to be able to install uh, an Apache web server, maybe you could reuse that role rather than having to cut and paste it into multiple playbooks. So in order to do the, uh, the create index uh, sync step, we have a role associated with it called create index and that role has a YAML file called main.yaml and it has exactly one step inside that YAML file which is to write an index.html file to the appropriate place within the Apache hierarchy and it says to do that using an Ansible template and it gives the name of that template which is index.html.j2 and it says to put that in the destination system under bar www.html index.html and then the second part of this is that we have to have the actual template itself and that is a Jinja2 template so that that's the syntax that you use to write this template in and it's located in this place within the uh, git hierarchy and the template just says to create a text file where the first line is example service the second line is service message with a colon and then a quoted string containing the service message and the final line is tenant message with a colon and a quoted string containing the tenant message. So I've we've, we've sort of throughout this discussion I think we've been talking about uh, sync steps and model policies and this this uh, this slide kind of drives home the differences between those and model policies are operational dependencies between models such as when you uh, create or change a model you want to create or change another model and we saw that um, when we created an example tenant we want to create an instance to go with it sync steps are steps that sync uh, from XOS to an underlying system and we saw that when when you went to uh, synchronize the example tenant by setting up the web server inside of the instance. You'll find these in different places inside of XOS and I will be uh, going through that when we do a little bit of a GitHub uh, code walkthrough in a moment. Uh, the, the key thing is that we've, we've done them in two slightly different ways. The core objects we have sort of a, an infrastructure for running its model policies where all of the model policies are in a directory and there's an engine that automatically runs them at the appropriate time. Uh, the service model policies, as you saw during the, this little example service walkthrough, is uh, encoded directly into the uh, example services models .py file. So at this point I'd like to uh, briefly stop for questions before we start uh, opening up the GitHub window and and looking at code. Does anyone does anyone have uh, any questions about example service in particular? Scott, could you um, speak a little bit to service isolation and how one service is isolated from another and so how one Ansible script is essentially protected from uh, stepping on another? Yeah, well, I'll try to answer that. Um, so the, each synchronizer has its own synchronizer directory, and the Ansible scripts are located in a steps directory within that synchronizer. So there isn't much sharing of synchronizer steps between synchronizers in the way we have it currently implemented. Is that what you were going for? Or would this tie into the roles? I, I was talking more about if, if I'm running an Ansible script that installs Apache and another service instantiates and its Ansible script uninstalls Apache, how is one service protected from another? So in the way that we've done this to this point, generally each service has been managing one container and that container or instance is dedicated to that service so it hasn't it hasn't much been the case that multiple services are installing 
or removing software into the same the same compute resource. Now there is there is a little bit of an example of where that is um, broken down a bit, and that would be the virtual truck roll service, which does actually run some steps on the VSG container. And in that case, the implementers of those two services, which, which I think that would be me in both cases, but hypothetically the implementers of those two services have agreed that virtual truck roll wouldn't go along and start uninstalling the uh, the VSG's software. Thanks. Sure, sure. Okay, I have a question. Uh, with respect to these set of examples, I mean, I'm sort of very interested to see how the mobility team can add additional examples such as, you know, different access points for mobility, like Wi-Fi, you know, LTE, and you know, limited wave access points. So in our case, we call it virtual BBU of different types. What does it take for us to, you know, get some? I guess put these examples in, and, and you know, how should we go about it? Is it, you know, we just take take what you have, and, and what is it any recommendation? How fast can we get some bunch of mobility examples into this environment? So you're just asking how to onboard a bunch of uh, services? Right, a bunch of services relates to mobility stuff that we're doing, uh, and specifically to multiple radio access technologies. Yeah, so I mean it would depend a little bit on how your services are put together. Um, usually we suggest you kind of find the thing in XOS that's closest to what you're looking to use. I know that uh, MCORD had a VSG. I believe you have something like a VSG, and that uh, you know you've leveraged some some of looking at our VSG to figure out how to do that. I don't know. I don't know a whole lot about mobility services in particular, because I've mostly been working on R cord rather than M cord. But I would imagine that you would start off. You know, if you have something that isn't like an existing XOS service, you could start with something that's very basic like example service and morph that into what you're looking for and then uh, you know XOS will help you out with uh, if your data model changes it will know to automatically run the sync step so I assume in, with mobility things are going to be changing more often than they are with uh, residential cord so there will be more more interactions between objects, and this is where the observing of objects and the syncing of objects will come into play. You'll, they'll, right. The synchronizer will probably be getting a lot more use as things move around. Yeah, we have we have a lot of experts here on mobility. And they're all in this room as well. But I'm just thinking, how do we go about getting this, you know, kicked off and, and create these multi rat multi radio access technology examples? In just, I think the answer I give is you start. With, I would start with example service and see if you could. Figure that. Yeah, I mean, we're going to meet this afternoon to okay. hash through some examples, but okay. example is pretty vanilla and pretty pretty common. Yeah, and example services we've we've tried to have it very well documented, so that the documentation walks you through exactly how it's all put together. So, it's it's a good starting place if you have a service that doesn't fit, you know, an existing pattern that we have. Would we'll start from there. I'll use that as a transition. Because they don't all look the same, here are some other services that they'll just call. Yeah, out. yeah. So let's uh, let's start by looking at the uh, CDN service. I assume everyone saw my window switch over to uh, GitHub. So if we go into XOS, uh, first of all, just taking. A... Could you blow up your text a little bit? Let me see if I can. Is that working? Yeah. Is that working? Yeah, I can yeah, see yeah. it. Okay, we're good. We're good. Thanks. Okay, yeah. So I've gone into the services directory in XOS, and that's where you're going to find all of the service code. So everything that is not considered to be part of the XOS core service is here. So basically everything that is not OpenStack related. So if we go into the, uh, the HPC subdirectory, that's uh, what the CDN service is called, kind of for uh, historical reasons, is called HPC. 
And then inside of its uh, service directory, we'll see several files here. There's a models.py file and an admin.py file. Um, going into the models.py, we can see that there'll be a bunch of models defined for the HPC service. And it has, just like example service, had a service model that was uh, subclassed from service. HPC service also has a service model that's subclassed from service and it has some additional parameters that it puts on that model. It actually did implement a scaling option that would uh, let you scale it, but it's, it starts to diverge here from the sort of canonical XOS tenancy model that we've had, uh, mainly because the Akamai product itself diverged from our model. Rather than having a single tenant abstraction, it kind of had this uh, two-tiered service provider, content provider abstraction, so you can see we've got models for that. You can see some of the richness of the uh, Django fields that you can choose. There's integer fields, character fields, booleans. Uh, there's a foreign key that lets you relate two objects. So there's a service provider, a content provider. Um, there's a many-to-many -many in here that lets you relate uh, content providers to users. There's origin servers, CDN prefixes, access maps, and site maps. So the the CDN service is uh, is a fairly complex multi-model service and demonstrates a variety of techniques here in its models.py. Um, while I go through the service directories, I'm also going to jump ahead a little bit and show you some of the admin code just because it's uh, right here. So Django has a built-in um, admin functionality that will generate a user interface that you can use as part of the developer view to um, add objects, delete objects, um, edit objects, um, etc. And it, it sort of blends seamlessly into the rest of the XOS UI. But you have to write a little bit of code to do that. But the code is mostly involves just uh, listing what fields you want displayed in your UI. So for example, going down to um, content provider, you know, it says for the content provider, let's display the name field, the enabled description, service provider, and the list of users. And there's lots of examples of this boilerplate. If we went into example service, it would be much less complicated than what we're seeing here for the CDN service. And then let's take a quick look at the uh, CDN services uh, synchronizer. We'll find um, all of the synchronizers in this uh, synchronizers directory. And again, the one for the CDN is called HPC. And there'll be a steps directory. And the steps directory will have all of the Python files that implement the, uh, the various sync steps. Now what's uh, somewhat unique about the HPC synchronizer is it does not use Ansible at all. It uses XML RPC. So if we look inside of its uh, content provider sync step, uh, the syntax is a little bit different. We don't have that get extra attributes function. We have instead this sync record function. And this sync record function it kind of inspects the data model object, it extracts some fields out of it, puts it in a dictionary, and then it makes an XML RPC call to either create the object or uh, update the object as is appropriate. Let's take a look at a couple of other services. So we have the Ono service. And just like the others, it has an admin.py and a models.py. Inside the models.py, there'll be an Onos service object and has lots of Onos wide attributes, such as the REST API to uh, talk to Onos on. It also has uh, its unit of tenants decided to call the Onos app instead of Onos tenant, uh, just because uh, you know Onos developers understand Ono's apps, and that seemed like a more uh, more intuitive thing to call it. And the Ono's app, um, it has a few attributes with it. it what dependencies, the name of the app, etc. 
and it also has a model policy down here. Although this model policy is uh, it's commented out, so it doesn't actually need to do anything down there. So that's a, that's a stub for where a model policy uh, would be if there was one. Looking at the synchronizer for uh, Onos, just like every other synchronizer, it's going to have some steps. There's actually two different steps. One syncs Onos services, the other syncs Onos apps. And the step that syncs the apps, it actually has some uh, some nice work that we've been doing to auto configure some of the uh, variables inside of the uh, the app. For example, for VTN to to do some auto configuration for it. That's a good example of implementing some custom functionality into your uh, sync step. And then down here near the bottom there is that familiar uh, get extra attributes function kind of split into a couple of parts you know where it uh, sets rest configs, host names, ports, um, app names, dependencies. Then if we look at the uh, Onos app synchronizer, the, the uh, playbook for it. Uh, we can see down here where there's a number of different steps that it executes, including waiting to make sure that the Onos service is online. Um, so this is, we, we've kind of designed this so it can work with Onos running in containers, it can run work with Onos running in LXC, etc. So there's lots of uh, if def conditional sections on this. So you can see we can copy config files into Onos. Um, down here we can do uh, REST posts into Onos so we can configure Onos using its REST API. We can activate the Onos apps. We do that down here using a REST API with Onos. And then finally down here we can post like uh, the Onos network config gets posted in this part of the recipe. Then I think the other uh, primary uh, services I wanted to look at, well, I guess there's two I want to look at. First, you know, we need to touch on Core a little bit because Core has all of the OpenStack objects. And Core, rather than having a single models.py, just because there's so many objects, it breaks them all into many different individual files. So, for example, if you wanted to see how XOS handles uh, instances, you would go into uh, core models uh, instance.py and scrolling down into here you can see the instance object. See the instance object has uh, lots of fields. There is, you know, for example, instances are associated with images. They have creators. They're grouped into slices. They're instantiated on nodes. They have flavors, uh, user data, isolation. Uh, these are all the things that are stored in the data model for uh, an instance. An important thing to note in here is also this PL core base. This is the base class for all XOS objects, and it defines a number of uh, fields that are that are pretty much used by all XOS objects. And there's, uh, you know, some important timestamps that the synchronizer uses to know when objects are created, updated, uh, when they've been synced, and when the policies have been applied. There's some fields that have synchronizer status um, coming from the synchronizer going back into the data model. Uh, there's some bits down here that let you turn on and off various synchronizer features. Core also has its... Uh, its own uh, admin.py. This uh, admin.py is very long because it has the admins for all of the core objects in it. And for example, there is uh, instance admin is buried in the middle of this and tells uh, Django how to display the instance objects in the uh, in the developer UI. Looking at the core synchronizer. It's, uh, it's actually called OpenStack since that's what it syncs to. 
like all the other synchronizers, it has a steps directory. And its uh, steps are slightly different than the service synchronizers in that it has uh, these map sync inputs functions, which function sort of like that get extra attributes function that we saw in example service, um, which is basically going through the data model, finding all of the interesting bits of information, and then down here at the bottom, stuffing all that information into a dictionary, which we can pass to the uh, template engine to instantiate the uh, Ansible template. So looking at the template itself, um, for the core object, since they uh, use OpenStack, we've leveraged an existing uh, Ansible module that knows how to control OpenStack. So we can simply have a task called Nova Compute that links into the uh, into that Ansible controlling module and by supplying all of these arguments to it this will cause Ansible to instantiate the compute resource for us. The last object I wanted to be able to point people to is or the last service would be the uh, the cord services. Just uh, historically we originally decided to locate all of the cord services in the same models.py. We're currently working on breaking those back out. But if you're looking for the VSG or the uh, the Volt or something like that, you're going to find it inside services cord models.py. This is where you can find cord subscriber root as well as the Volt service, uh, the Volt tenant. the VSG service, and the uh, VSG tenant. Uh, likewise, you'll find the synchronizers uh, for the cord services. Those are actually broken out, so you'll find the, the VSG synchronizer. It's uh, still been a directory called VCPE, just some historical naming that needs to be corrected. But you'll see that there's uh, steps. You'll see there's a sync uh, VCP tenant, and it's responsible. It has a very long get extra attributes function that goes through and pulls out all VCP specific information and stuffs it in a big dictionary. And then you'll see a YAML. Currently, we're using uh, this uh, VTN-based uh, VSG, so I think you'll find it in this YAML file. And this knows to um, how to configure the all of the networking in the VSG, doing all these various steps, setting things up, and then uh, actually starts the VSG. There's parts of this that can react to changes in the VSG. Uh, you know, so here you see the bandwidth limit script is uh, installed, and then when it, uh, you install that, you reset the bandwidth limits. You call that action. So if we found a handler down here for reset bandwidth limits, uh, the VSG does that by invoking Docker and running that particular command. So that's kind of how we bring up a VSG and how we uh, maintain it. So just. Uh, the last little bit of this presentation I wanted to touch on where you find some of the other things um, that that you're going to hook your service into, uh, which are going to be the REST API. We've already covered the admin GUI, but let's cover the REST API and uh, Tosca. So the REST API you're going to find by going to the uh, API subdirectory. And as Larry showed earlier in the uh, tutorial, we've broken out the APIs into service APIs and uh, tenant APIs. So if we went into the tenant APIs, we will see that inside of here is example tenant, uh, truck roll, there's a cord subdirectory which has subscriber and volt, uh, there's an ONO subdirectory that has app, but just looking inside of example tenant, um, we leverage something called Django REST Framework. Uh, we leverage that pretty heavily to do the APIs. And to, to uh, set up an API in Django REST Framework, you first create a serializer. The serializer 
is that bit of code that knows how to convert the data model into a REST API representation uh, for the REST protocol. So it has fields in it that correspond to the, uh, the fields in the data model object. You Oftentimes you don't include all of the fields because there's a lot of very specific uh, synchronizer related uh, stuff that people running the API don't really care about. So we've we've handcrafted many of these APIs to just provide what the person calling the API is going to want. So an example tenant, uh, the main important thing to it is this tenant message. Uh, so it has a serializer, then it has a view set. And the view set is responsible for implementing the uh, get, post, uh, put, and patch actions. Those are parts of the uh, REST protocol. It leverages this uh, Django REST view set via the XOS view set so that most of that functionality is, is built in. Um, you'll see in some of the other uh, APIs like the BSG API, there's a lot more complexity. Example, uh, Tenant does at least demonstrate how to create a custom API endpoint. So in addition to just getting and putting an example tenant, you can also just get and put a message. So we've kind of put a toy example of that here. To do that, you add a new URL and you, you create a functions for getting and setting on that uh, URL. Now the, uh, the Tosca system, you'll find inside of the Tosca directory. Uh, when adding objects to Tosca, you will typically find uh, that you'll need to touch two different things. The first is these custom types. Uh, now you have the option of uh, putting your custom type in an individual file or just jamming it into the XOS file. We'd probably prefer that moving forward people create the individual files, but just the state we're in now, there's a lot of stuff in the, uh, the main XOS file. So for example, if we went in here and we search for example service, we will see that this, uh, this defines what, uh, how, how example service is uh, implemented in Tosca, specifies the properties and capabilities that the example service Tosca um, object provides. So for example, if we look at something more complicated like the VSG service, uh, we can see there's a lot of uh, VSG additional properties. So you'll probably want to create one of those to go with your service and then you'll need to go down into this resource directory and write the code that is responsible for uh, interpreting the Tosca fields and applying them to the data model. So inside of example service, we've, we've kind of tried to make this as, as painless as possible. So there's a lot of uh, stuff in the, the base class that helps you out. For example, you just have to supply this copy in properties uh, field here, and this will copy all of those things from Tosca into the data model object. We do have a hook if you need to do some additional sort of complex stuff in this uh, post-process section. For example, this allows you to attach an example service via tenancy relationship to another service. And we have some additional functionality you can uh, add for doing things like uh, preventing your object from being deleted in Tosca while there's still uh, other people using it. I think that pretty much wraps up. Yeah, that'll be the next section. So there is a, uh, a video tutorial that is now available that will show you how to construct a view. And I believe the link for that tutorial has been posted to the XOS uh, Slack channel. So I'm open for questions at this point. I have one very general question. May I? <laughs> When I build the, uh, I saw when uh, Scott uh, described the owners as a uh, service. So indeed, when I build the app called the environment, I need to let the OpenStack XOS uh, on the and the infrastructure work first. Then I boot the VMs and instances. 
Uh, but right now, I saw almost as a service. So for long term, should I delete the onos instead of the infra infrastructure and run it as a service? I'm having a little bit trouble hearing the question over the uh, conference connection. Could you ask again? Well, let, let me. So if Imcore were going to build on Onos as a service, as if it's an art core, that's that's kind of the context of the question. Oh, uh, may I build the Mcore environment? I need to set up the Onos uh, XOS and OpenStack and the infrastructure software. Build this, make this first, work first, and then boot the instance. But well, uh, on the tutorial, Onos is also can work as a service. Oh, so what? I. Yeah. It just. I think we're going to see this more in the next session. Okay. As we actually boot things up, I, so I mean, let, let's postpone it to uh, what Andy's going to talk about because you he's going to be bringing the the head nodes up and all the containers there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, you're going to have have to have Onos running before you can start. Bring apps on it. Other questions? So I think Scott, if you could uh, make Andy the presenter, hopefully this will. Sure, I will try to figure out how to do that. Change presenter to Andy. You should have presentership. And we see his screen, I think. Right. Um, do you see the slides now? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so I realize I am starting uh, my part after we've been spraying information uh, on the audience for I think uh, two and a so half hours now. I, I got mine all the way up. Yeah. Andy, could you? Yes. Is it possible to be closer to your mic? Um, I'm not sure if it's a speaker system or what it is exactly. And if anyone else it's still got their... Um, how's this? Is that better? Okay. All right. Okay. So um, what I will be talking about is configuration management. So our configurations are um, essentially tools that we've put together to make it easier to bring up XOS uh, for specific uses. So I'll be talking about um, the elements of a configuration, what what makes it up. Um, they all follow the same basic template. Uh, I'll look at a few of the configurations that we've built that might be a good starting place for people who are trying to do new things uh, with Cord. And um, then finally, I'll walk through the example services demo. OK. <coughs> All right, so I mentioned that um, configurations are, are you know, scripts and tools that we've put together to uh, mm -hmm. configure XOS. Um, for specific purposes. Um, so, for instance, um, we'll look at three configurations right now. We'll look at um, the front end configuration, which is mainly useful if you're developing the XOS GUI. So, you don't really need OpenStack and all of that stuff um, behind you. You just want to do some uh, development on the GUI itself. Um, we'll look at the devel configuration, which is for XOS development and testing. So you hook up XOS to an existing OpenStack, uh, and then you can create instances using XOS. We'll also look at the Cord Pod configuration, which is probably the most uh, interesting and also involved configuration that we have. So this is, I think, the most useful one for people who are looking to contribute to Cord or evaluate uh, Cord in some way. So we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about the, the Cord pod configuration. So each of these configurations does basically three things. It brings up the XOS containers that Larry 
mentioned at the beginning of um, this tutorial. So a database container, a, a GUI container, and um, the synchronizer containers. <laughs> it does some configuration of XOS to talk to OpenStack on the back end. So just setting up credentials and uh, URLs so it knows how to access the OpenStack services. And then it does additional configuration to XOS data model, adding other objects uh, via running uh, Tosca scripts. And so we'll look at a couple of examples of um, how this all works. All right, so in terms of breaking down the elements of a configuration in a little bit more depth, so I said the first thing it does is bring up the XOS containers. Um, the way it does this is using um, Docker images and the Docker Compose uh, tool. And so there's a, a uh, so I should say that in all of the, the XOS development, we're using Docker, Docker Images, Docker Compose. Um, so people looking to develop XOS or work with XOS, it pays to get familiar with these tools. Um, it, it will pay off. So um, the Docker Compose.yaml file contains definitions of all of the containers that get spun up. <coughs> so database and GUI and synchronizers. There's also a make file that we provide in each configuration that has some targets for manipulating containers. So if you in, don't, so instead of saying, you know, Docker compose up, you can type like make, you just type make and then it'll bring everything up. So just you know a, a wrapper on top of the Docker tools um, to hopefully make it a little bit easier uh, to work with these configurations. So the second thing that a configuration does is set up XOS to talk to a specific OpenStack backend. Um, we have some generic. Um, make file targets to help with this for different um, scenarios in which you might want to run XOS. So we've been running it on Cloud Lab quite a lot. Um, also we've been we have some basic, very basic support for DevStack, but not not quite as uh, extensive as our Cloud Lab support. But there's some some make files that um, live in this common directory um, that are used to, to configure SOS to, to talk to OpenStack as set up by these different environments. And then the third thing um, that a configuration does is uses Tosca to configure the XOS data model. So Scott already talked about um, Tosca a bit and how to add Tosca support to your service. Um, so in the configurations directory there will be some Tosca files that um, contain configuration state and they have a, a .yaml suffix. So um, these contain Tosca, Tosca definitions. And also the make file we usually include some targets for invoking the Tosca engine using these YAML files. So you can type, for instance, make cord is used to um, tell XOS to process a number of Tosca files that define the initial state of a, a cord development pod. And I'll show you an example of that shortly. All right. So <clears throat> before I launch into the cord pod configuration, let's look at um, the other two configurations that I mentioned 
um, a minute ago, the front end configuration and um, the develop configuration. So can you read my terminal right now? Is that is that big enough? Uh, bigger would be. Uh, bigger would be. A little bigger. Like, Did you say a little bit bigger? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. Uh, that does. It. <laughs> That's okay. All right. All right. So. Um, Larry and Scott mentioned the Git repository for XOS. So the repository has been checked out here. Um, and I'm going to change to the configurations directory where everything lives. Um, there's a number of configurations that are in here. And we're going to start out by looking at the front end configuration. So here are the files that um, live in this configuration. So let me start by looking at the docker compose um, .yaml. So as I mentioned, this contains the um, docker container definitions for what will be brought up when, when XOS is launched for this configuration. So here in this front end configuration, I mentioned this is just for developing the GUI. There's no open stack. There's no synchronizers. There's just two containers. There's the database container defined up here at the top. Um, and then the XOS container that's running the GUI, which is, which is the rest of this uh, configuration here. So I won't go through this definition in detail. I encourage you to take a look at the Docker um, and Docker Compose specs. Um, but essentially, it's basing the container on this particular image. This pre-built version of this image, the XOS image, lives on Docker Hub. It's updated every time there's a commit to the XOS um, uh, GitHub repository to master on the, the GitHub repository. So you can go here and pull down the latest uh, XOS container build. <clears throat> you can also, um, if you are, say, doing development, you can also build your own containers locally using um, the, the local source tree. So what you could do is modify the, um, your local source tree, for instance, to add the example service into your XOS configuration, and then build the containers. And then when you, uh, in a configuration, you launch XOS, it will use the local containers that you built. Um, OK. so. There's an image. There's a command that runs in the image. Um, there's also some files down here under volumes that are mounted inside that image. Um, I don't see anything here in particular that I want to talk about, but later on when we get to the synchronizers, I'll point out a couple of things. So that's all I want to say about Docker Compose. Um, let's take a look at the make file. <coughs> so one of the purposes of the make is um, it lets you manage XOS by invoking make commands. Um, so for instance, make or make front end will bring up um, all of the containers. This is the command that actually spins up all of these Docker containers. And the Docker Compose uh, command will also, as I mentioned, pull down 
the images from Docker Hub if they're not already present locally. So in general, what this make file is doing when you type make is it's first, um, with this line, it's installing some software, installing Docker if Docker is not already running on the node or not already present on the node. The second line brings up the containers. This third line is um, just a little script that waits for XOS to finish initializing and start listening uh, for connections on the web interface. And then this final line here is running a Tosca uh, configuration to load additional state into XOS. <coughs> so that Tosca configuration is called sample.yaml. So let's take a look at that. <coughs> okay, so this um, YAML file, it's basically just populating the XOS data model to simulate um, controlling an OpenStack cluster. So as I mentioned, this is just for um, developing the front end. There's not really OpenStack, but it loads some models into XOS um, load some objects into XOS that would be present if XOS was actually controlling um, an OpenStack cluster. So there's, it um, creates an image um, up here, it creates an image um, which is um, the actual disk image that we use on uh, our OpenStack deployments. It creates a deployment object that knows about the image. It creates a controller object. This is this controller object is the thing that knows about the OpenStack credentials um, for the, the cluster that is being controlled. So these are just fake credentials because there's no real cluster. But the, the controller object is there. There's a site object. Uh, what else is of interest here? Okay, and down here at the bottom, there are a couple of fake nodes that are defined. So this is this fake cluster, OpenStack cluster has two fake nodes. So when you bring up XOS with this configuration, you'll log in and you'll see a deployment with a site, and that site will have nodes, um, and so. Um, you can use that for your, your GUI development. So another um, use of this uh, front-end configuration has been for developing some of the views for Cord, and so there's also a service chain.yaml file that has um, that defines objects that would be present in a cord pod. So, uh, so again, there's no. This is not for really controlling a real cord pod. But let's say you're developing the GUI and you just need some objects that would be present in cord. So it's a simulated cord pod. So there's a cord subscriber defined here, um, a cord user. So the user has a, um, a MAC address associated with the user and some other information. Um, there's another cord subscriber. There's some information about a, uh, a vault object. Uh, with S tags and C tags associated with it. <coughs> uh, 
um, some services, cord services down here. Here's the, the, the Volt service is defined here with a number of, of networks associated with it. Uh, VCPE service. So this, um, this YAML file populates the data model with a number of cord objects. Um, I don't see anything else maybe to, to call out here. Okay, so you could, you know, for different scenarios, if you're just developing the front end, you could create a Tosca file to populate uh, XOS with the objects of interest. So that's a pretty simple configuration. Let me switch over to the Devel configuration. So uh, this configuration um, sets up XOS to talk to an existing OpenStack setup on Cloud Lab or on DevStack. <coughs> so you can think of this as maybe a bare bones environment for developing new standalone services. So I don't think you would want to use this configuration for developing Cord. You would want to use the Cord Pod configuration that I'll show you in a minute. Um, but this is a simple configuration that could be useful for developing um, new services for XOS. So again, there's a Docker Compose file. Let's take a look. <coughs> so it defines the containers. There's the database container. There's a synchronizer container now because this is talking to, to OpenStack. And um, this synchronizer container um, is running um, this code. That's the, the entry point to the OpenStack uh, synchronizer that uses all of the machinery that um, Scott was walking through earlier. And at the bottom here, we also have the, the XOS uh, GUI container. So this is very similar to the front end container, except now we've added a synchronizer container. Let's take a look at the make file. <coughs> so the make file is um, designed to set up the um, XOS for a Cloud Lab environment or a DevStack environment. Both of these look a little bit different. Um, the code that is used to um, set up XOS for a particular environment is located in this common directory. So there's a make file. Let me actually just go in there. Uh, common. This has some tools that are used by multiple configurations. So there's a, a cloud lab make file that knows, for instance, where the X or the, the OpenStack credentials generated by Cloud Lab, it knows where they live. And so it can go fetch them and, and put them in a place where XOS can use them. Um, I don't actually want to go into these in detail. Uh, just to let you know that they're there. So back to the devel make file. <clears throat> so depending on what environment you're running in, Cloud Lab or DevStack, it'll do some environment specific stuff. And then it does essentially the same thing as the other configuration. Use runs a docker compose command to bring up the containers. It waits for them to come up. And then it starts running um, Tosca um, configuration. Something that I didn't mention before is that the make file as a convenience provides a number of other 
um, wrappers around Docker Compose commands. So if you type make stop, it'll bring down all of the containers. If you type uh, make rm, it will bring them down and then uh, delete them. If you type make ps, it'll show you what containers are running uh, and so on. In each of these configuration directories, there's also a uh, a readme file that, that explains what are the, the make file targets. So um, that's a great place to start when you're getting um, when you're starting to use a, a configuration, definitely check out the README. Okay. <clears throat> so we've looked at a couple of simple configurations. Hopefully you've gotten a uh, kind of taste of what configurations can be used for. Um, it looks like oops, I saw a message saying that I'd lost connectivity to my demo machine, so I was figuring the, the, the demo curse was hitting me. Um, okay, <clears throat> so let's go back to the slides before I start showing you the, the core type configuration. <clears throat> Let me um, talk a little bit more through the slides. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so the cord pod configuration is much more involved than the other ones that I've shown you through, uh, kind of walked you through a little bit, because the cord pod configuration walks you through all of the steps of bringing up a cord pod from scratch, from Ubuntu, you know, Ubuntu servers, servers running Ubuntu. So there's a number of steps to the cord pod. Um, there's um, the first one is installing OpenStack on a single node. You might use this for development. That's, I think, the main use of it. Or just to get familiar with the configuration and ensure yourself that it actually works and learn about how all the pieces fit together. Or you can install OpenStack on a cluster, um, and this is exactly how we're bringing up the pods that, um, for instance, AT&T is evaluating right now using this um, cord pod configuration and this specific recipe for bringing up OpenStack. So the next step after you've brought up OpenStack is to set up the Onos uh, VTN app. So open vSwitch on the, the Nova compute nodes is controlled by VTN. VTN is providing the virtual networks. So you need to set that up. Um, in the case where you're, you don't have a real fabric plugged in to the box, so for instance, in the single node case, um, I think you would want to do this. You would run a simulated fabric. I'll show you how to set that up. Set up external connectivity through the simulated fabric. And then the fourth step is um, bringing up XOS with the cord services. So the cord pod configuration, let me show you in the web browser. <coughs> the cord pod configuration has a readme that talks about all of these steps right here. Um, so this is the place to start with the cord pod configuration. In this readme. So the cord pod configuration um, has the uh, same pieces that um, the other configurations do in terms of Docker Compose and Makefile. Um, let's go up here. Um, Docker Compose file, it has a Makefile here, it has a bunch of um, YAML files. 
um, has the same elements. And um, I will we'll dig into those in a minute. First of all, um, so I'm going to get to the demo in a minute. Um, this slide, um, maybe I should walk through a little in a little bit more depth. Um, so this started out as a cheat sheet of commands that might be useful to you as you get going with the, the cord pod configuration. So let's go back to the previous slide. So I mentioned that step one is installing OpenStack on a single node or a cluster. Um, for the demo, what I've done is gone ahead and followed the recipe that is here in uh, this tutorial me readme <coughs> for bringing up the um, a single node cord pod and I'm running it on Cloud Lab. This is what I was showing you here. And so maybe I should take a minute to show you, to kind of walk through what um, the head node looks like or what the single node pod actually looks like after you've stepped through this process for, for installing OpenStack and the other services on this node. So all of the services that the install process um, sets up are running in separate VMs. So if you type on the head node, if you type uh, versh list, it'll show you all of the running uh, VMs. So all of the different services that OpenStack uses internally um, are running in different VMs. So MySQL, Rabbit, MQ, Keystone, Glance, Neutron, the dashboard, Solometer, etc. <coughs> are each running in their own VM. There's also a VM that is um, running XOS. So it's running <coughs> the containers that I showed you in the Docker Compose file are, actually, are, are isolated inside this VM. And then there's some, some ONOS VMs that get set up. And in this single node case, right, so we're running um, only one node. So the, the compute node that is controlled by OpenStack is actually also running as a VM. So you can, when you create VMs on this compute node, they're created using QMU inside um, this VM. So all this gets set up by the install process that is um, mentioned in the, the cord pod readme. It's easy to go into any one of these VMs. You just type SSH Ubuntu is the user at the name of the VM. So let's go into the ONUS cord VM. <coughs> the install procedure sets up this VM and it also downloads, um, it sets up a, a Docker Compose uh, a simple Docker Compose file inside this VM to actually launch ONOS in a Docker container from Docker Hub. So if we type Docker Compose PS, we'll see that that thing is already running. So this is this is a container that's that's running ONOS. Likewise, if we go to Let's, let's look at all the, the uh, VMs again. If we type SSH Ubuntu at XOS, now we're in the XOS uh, virtual machine that I was showing you earlier. This is where we were looking at the configurations.
And here now we're in the cord pod configuration directory. <coughs> okay, let me pop back to the slides really quickly. <coughs> So Versh list, that's what I used to show you um, all of the virtual machines running on the head node. SSH, Ubuntu, at the machine name, that's how you get into one of them. So it's already set up all of the keys and everything, so you don't need to worry about that. Inside the XOS virtual machine, we're going to be looking at the cord pod configuration. It lives in um, XOS, XOS configurations cord pod. We're going to run a bunch of make commands to set everything up. I'll go into these in, in more detail in a minute. We'll, we'll actually try it out and see if it works. Um, and then in, in terms of cheat sheet, I mentioned Docker Compose PS shows you the running containers. We use that to see the owner container. Let's go back and do it in the actual way. Docker Compose PS. Right, so there's nothing running here. We haven't brought up XOS yet. That's what we're going to do as part of this demo. We're actually going to bring up XOS. And then as part of the cheat sheet, I also included uh, a command for entering into a container so that you can take a look around or um, run additional uh, commands. But we don't we haven't brought up XOS yet, so we can't do that. Okay. So let's get to the demo now. <coughs> so this is a demo of um, creating the example service um, service that we've been talking about, adding that to XOS into a cord pod, and then showing that a subscriber can actually access this example service, so a cord subscriber. <coughs> There's this readme file in the, um, the cord pod configuration, readme tutorial, that is what I used to set up the demo. <coughs> so what the demo is going to do, so we've already set up the single node cord pod. That part's done. The demo is going to use XOS to configure BTN. It's going to install all of the cord services into XOS. Um, as well as example service. It's going to create a sample subscriber um, with a simulated subscriber device. I've already set up this subscriber device, but again, how to do it is in this README. And then we'll show that the subscriber can access the example service. Okay. All right. So with that, um, let's go back over to <coughs> to here. So may, actually maybe I should pause um, to see if there are any questions before I launch into the demo. I don't see, I don't see. Okay, well um, if questions come up during the demo then, then uh, I'm happy to answer them. So, but let's let's go ahead and, and take a look. All right. So, as I mentioned, the starting setup here is you've been following the instructions in the tutorial README. You've set up OpenStack. You've brought up the Onos container, but it's not running any apps yet. You've already modified XOS to add the example service, as talked about in the um, in the uh, example service tutorial in the in the guide that, that Larry mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and so 
XOS containers have already been rebuilt in the, with the example service, already configured into the service graph. And now we're at the point where we're ready to fire up XOS and let it configure all the pieces. So to do that, we're going to run a bunch of make commands. And let's go ahead and look at the readme here. OK. <coughs> we're going to run some make commands. They're listed here. <coughs> First one is just, we're just going to run make. So this is going to uh, bring up the XOS containers and configure them to talk to OpenStack and add some very basic objects. So I showed you that there's no containers running yet as part of this configuration. So let's type make and see what happens. <clears throat> All right, so it's creating a bunch of containers. Most of them are synchronizer containers for the various cord services that we're going to be running. Now the exo, uh, the containers are being spun up right now. Um, it takes a minute. XOS is being configured to talk to OpenStack. Deployment objects, site objects, user objects are being added, but there won't be any services uh, added just yet. And we'll see that. We'll go into the GUI. <clears throat> so as soon as this waiting for XOS to come up returns, then we can take a look at the GUI. So in order to take a look at the GUI, so recall that XOS is running inside of a virtual machine that's running on this node. The virtual machine itself is not, um, doesn't have its own public IP address. <coughs> it's connected to the management network of the pod, <coughs> which is a private network. But I want to be able, for this demo, to look at the XOS GUI. So what I'm going to do is create an uh, SSH tunnel to the node, the Cloud Lab node that the demo is running on. So I will execute that. And now I should be able to see the XOS GUI in my browser locally at this URL. Let's see if it works. OK. Can everybody see that? see the XOS GUI? Yep. Or see the XOS login screen, I should say. All right, good. All right, so <coughs> XOS is up. Just logged in. I said we configured a bunch of objects. Go back to the window. <coughs> These messages here are um, <coughs> output by the Tosca scripts that are running, uh, configuring objects in XOS. Um, so we should be able to see them in the GUI. Okay, so there's a site object. Um, a user object, the, the green check mark means that it's been synced with the back end, so that's good. So XOS is up. It's got some basic state. Oh, I said that there were no services deployed yet, so if I click on services, I see that there are none uh, configured yet. So now we can move on to the next step, which is to configure VTN. <coughs> so if I type make VTN, let's actually first take a look at the make file. 
So make VTN, all it does is um, processes, oops, sorry, I have another meeting now, um, processes through, um, processes this TOSCA file, VTN external .yaml. Take a look at that. So this sets up the Onos VTN service. This is the thing that is going to generate VTN, um, the, the configuration for the Onos VTN app, and then push it to Onos. So there's the service object, service Onos VTN, and this Onos app project, that's our <coughs> object, that's the, the tenant. And it's got these properties. So the, the dependencies are the list of all of the, the, um, the Onos apps that are going to be loaded into Onos. <coughs> and then we are also telling it that we want it to auto-generate the VTN network configuration and push that to Onos. So let's type make VTN. <coughs> okay, so now this is uh, configuring VTN. So let's go back to the Exos GUI. And now, okay, sorry about that. So now we should see a service in our service grid. Yep, there it is. Service Onos VTN. This is the, the VTN service that we just configured. And so the, the Onos synchronizer, let me show it. This one is the one that's responsible for actually generating the uh, VTN configuration and pushing it to Onos. So let's and, and log. Can, and yes. We have a question. So, yes. Uh, as part of the values, as part of the values, um, this is the uh, mechanism, mechanism, this controllers, this commands under the of the controller to the uh, What I understand. Yeah. So, Andy, could you go mute for just a second? Maybe you just did. Yeah. Sorry, can I? Go ahead, jump in. Um, so I didn't actually catch the question. I was um, putting some headphones on to, to try to see if I could hear better. Uh, can you ask it again, please? Okay, yeah. Uh, as part of the Larry's presentation, we uh, we have seen three uh, models of um, service controllers, right? One is the native XOS native, the other one is legacy, and another one is intermediate one. Uh, the plumbing of Onos VTN service inside XOS does it come under the intermediate uh, mechanism, where we have already the Onos VTN running on a separate VM, all we are doing is making it visible inside the XOS. Is that the correct understanding? Yes, exactly. That's right. So the, in what I was showing you um, here, the Onos BTN um, container is created uh, before XOS even starts running. So it already exists, and we're just telling XOS how to contact the REST API of that container so it can push configuration state into it. Okay. Yeah, thanks. All right, so for end-to-end, -end, push a button, and you get a pod, we have to also bring that up as a separate step, kind of like he just quickly went over 
and magic happened and, and OpenStack came up. Okay, the, there's there's a recipe for doing that, but it's not automated. Right. Is that a fair statement? Well, there's a recipe for doing that, and it's pretty well automated, but it's not part of XOS right now. It's a pre-processing step that you take, yeah. Uh, because I was right. trying to link up with Pink Pink's question. Yeah. Uh, because it seems like we need the ONOS and OpenStack even before XOS. Then how do you make ONOS itself as an XOS service? Right. So open. Uh, I'll try to answer the well, Andy. Oh, we, there was a, there's a a recipe for fairly fairly well automated bringing up OpenStack, and then and then you make XOS know about it. There is likewise a, a, a sequence of steps to bring up ONOS, and then you make XOS aware of it. Um, yeah, so you do have to go through those steps. It's fairly. And Andy can speak to how automated it is. It's, so it's not XOS bringing them up. It's a it's a it's a core boot sequence. So those recipes are outside of the XOS. They're right. So you right in the way that it's managed now, Andy. No, yeah. The only thing I would add is that the recipe for bringing up the pod is based on Ansible, which of course XOS synchronizers also use Ansible. So it would be pretty straightforward if one wanted to do this to fold it into XOS but that's not a step that we have taken so far it's currently a separate pre-processing step as Larry says um, to bring up the all of these virtual machines and download these docker containers and then you bring up XOS go ahead thanks Okay. Right. Um, oh, okay. So I was going to log into ONOS and see what was going on there. So ONOS is running in the ONOS Cord VM, listening on this special port. Um, So now I'm logged into ONOS, and if things have been synchronized, we should be able to type cord VTN nodes, and it should tell us, here's, okay, this looks good. So the host name is Nova Compute. That's the name of the virtual machine <coughs> running as a compute node. And there's some information that, that we gave it. <coughs> and the init status is complete, meaning everything uh, worked as expected. So that's good. So we can also take a look at the, the full configuration that was pushed um, by XOS to own us. And um, don't think I want to drill down into this blob of configuration in too much detail other than I'll point out that currently so one of the things you need to tell VTN are the the public gateways on the fabric that um, are used to access the external world the internet so there's nothing configured yet because in the next step we'll actually set up these public gateways so that's not there but everything else is set up um, for VTN. <coughs> so now the next step is make cord. <coughs> this is going to add the cord services. Let me let me fire this off and then I'll show you what it does. So it's adding the cord services. And it's also bringing up an example subscriber and creating a VSG for the subscriber. So if we take a look at the make file, uh, make cord um, runs 
uh, a bunch of Tosca scripts. The first one sets up the management network that's used by VTN. Uh, the second one just does some some fixtures. That's not interesting. And then um, the third one is the real meat. Um, this one, cord VTN VSG .yaml. Uh, This contains the definitions of all the the cord services. Let's check it out. So the first bit sets up cord services, uh, VTR, uh, Volt. I mentioned that there were no public gateways configured yet for VTN. Here are where the public gateways get defined. So there's currently in this configuration there's two separate gateways defined for um, the two different services we're going to be running. So the VSG has a gateway of this and 1068.01 and then example service has a different gateway. So <coughs> these will get be configured by, um, by VTN or into VTN. Some other services are set up. The VSG service, uh, vRouter service, Uh, um, the access network that are, is used by, by VTN to communicate with the VSG is set up. The VSG slice is set up. And now um, starting here we start configuring so previous to that we've been configuring the, the cord services and slices and the other things that um, that that we need on a cord installation and now we're going to start configuring a specific uh, example subscriber for for development for testing so there's a user there's a subscriber um, that that user controls or is the admin for. There's a bunch of devices associated with the subscriber, so mom's PC, dad's PC, and so on. These don't really correspond to anything in the demo setup. They're just objects that get loaded in um, for demo purposes and for testing. And then the important thing is down here at the bottom. So this is going to set up a Volt tenant, which will spin up a VSG. And the VSG has um, S tag, let me highlight it better, S tag 222 and C tag 111. So the traffic um, with that S tag and C tag will go to the VSG that is being spun up. So let's go back to the XOS GUI, click on services, and hold on. Andy, we have a question. Yes. Just quickly. Yes. So do we have to define all the uh, subscriber uh, device? So the devices, that was just for convenience, or when it came up, you had a test device. Okay. Normally, you would come in through the REST API. Through, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Right, exactly. For testing. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so if we go back to the XOS GUI and look at services, we see now there's a bunch of services defined, um, vRouter and VSG and Volt and so on. So if we look at slices, my site VSG, and now instances, we see that there was an instance brought up to host the VSG container that's being brought up for that subscriber. And the green check mark means that it's it's been created, it's ready to go. 
All right, so everything looks pretty good. So now let's bring up the example service. So make example service. All right, this is uh, runs another Tosca file pod example service, which is pretty simple. Andy, I, yes, where um, people are facing uh, their lunch deadlines here. I'm just, I think you, I think you can uh, go to the punchline and be okay. Okay. Uh, I think you're, I think you're pretty close. Yes. Um, okay. So, all right. So we brought up the example first. I'll try to pick up the page. And every now and then you, you're muted like something between you and the mic. Okay. Now, Sorry about that. Now you're good. I keep losing my SSH tunnel. I don't know why. All right, so what we're going to do is, um, now that we've added the example service, we need to do a little bit of configuration, and then uh, hopefully we'll see things working, and then everybody can have their lunch. All right, so we need to configure. This is the example service. We're configuring it, and we need to define a message as explained in the tutorial doc. This is the example service. So I'll save that. And now we need to add an example tenant. It's also described in the, the tutorial doc. <coughs> this is the example tenant. We'll put for its message. <coughs> save it. All right, so what's happening now is XOS is bringing up an instance for the example tenant. This is maybe going to take a minute. Uh, let's go see, check the progress. All right. And then once, okay, this is successfully enacted, so that's up. And once that's done, it's going to spin up the web server inside of that instance. Um, let me actually let me go here. Okay. So what I need to do now, we're almost at the punchline. Um, I need to log into this uh, VM that is brought, being brought up <clears throat> and take a look to make sure that something is configured correctly. So the way that VTN works is you need to be on the compute node in order to log into the management, uh, log into a VM via the management network. And for this uh, instance, the management network address is 172.27.03. So I'm going to log in. Now I'm inside the instance. OK. So things are configured correctly, so it should work. So Apache is still being installed right now um, by the example service synchronizer. So. We need to wait for that to finish. While we're waiting, so I mentioned that there's a, a simulated subscriber that is set up as part of the demo, a simulated subscriber device. And now I've just attached to it. So this 
simulated subscriber is emitting packets with the S tag and C tag combination for the VSG. So in this configuration, it's just a single node. There's no OLT. There's just some software bridging so that the packets from this test client are received on the data plane interface configured into VTN. So from VTN standpoint, they're arriving on the fabric, but there's not really a fabric. It's just, you know, a simulated fabric. So this interface is the one that we set up for the um, for the um, tag packets, and I need an IP address for that thing. So let me run DH client. Okay, now it got an IP address from the VSG. So if I run route. I see, so this 192.168.0.1, that's the VSG's IP address, and it's our gateway to the world. So I can uh, ping the world through the VSG, ping Google DNS. Okay, that works. <coughs> so we have external connectivity through the VSG. <coughs> uh, let's try to see whether the example service works. So let's go back to the example service and look at the example tenant. Okay, so there's a green check mark by our example tenant, so that's good. <coughs> now, I have And so if we curl, so remember that the, the example tenant installs uh, Apache server and is listening for connections. And so we'll hit this, and here it is. So it worked. So it contacted um, the the uh, Apache running an example service and downloaded the, the page with the messages that we configured. So that's essentially the punchline. Uh, just to recap really quickly, so what just happened when I typed curl in that um, simulated subscriber device? Right, so the subscriber device sent the HTTP GET request to that address. So the device's packets had the S tag and the C tag added to simulate the OLT. The packets from the device arrived with the S tag and C tag on the VTN data plane interface. So that simulates the fabric in a sense. Inside the VSG, um, the S tag and C tag were stripped off is forwarded to the VSG container, I should say in the VSG instance. <coughs> Inside the container, um, the request was forwarded uh, to the example service instance, and then Apache and the example service sent the reply, and the reply went back on, on the same path. So at a high level, the takeaway is this example service demo shows you basically a template for adding subscriber-facing services uh, to Cord. And so, as I said, there's a readme. You can walk through it, and you can you know, set up exactly what I showed you. So that's, that's all I got. That's it. Thanks, Andy. Yep. Um, all right, the world's most complicated hello world. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, lots of moving parts, and of course, um, he's showing you all the nuts and bolts underneath. I, 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 as I was, we were doing this as the first time running through. I think it is worth restating something that I came up earlier, which is we've sort of cast this as, as on behalf of the developer. 
if you were going to operate this, that we would have you could tell this story a little bit differently, and you wouldn't have had to see some of some of this stuff. But I think from most of us are going to be developers right now, and so that's the, that's the perspective. Um, so it is getting a little bit late, so let's go ahead and break. This will be we'll edit it down, we'll post it, we'll put a link up to the video. Uh, you now know about all the mailing lists and the Slack channels. So as you take Hello World, I'm sorry, Hello Example Service for a spin, post your questions there. Um, and the other, like the challenging thing is is adapting it to your particular service, and that's something that's quite often worth discussing because there's more than one way to skin a cat in a lot of these. But hopefully, this will give you some some references to to use as starting examples. Um, any other quick questions before we quit? All right, thank you very much. Bye-bye.